morning, everyone, and welcome to First Baptist Church. I'm Hannah Riggs, and we are so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. If you are a first-time guest, we want to welcome you here, and we are so excited that you came to worship with us. We've got a lot going on these next few weeks, so we wanted to take a few minutes to share with you what's going on for you and your family. Once again, if you are a guest here, thank you for coming. You can text the word GUEST to our phone number, 417-256-3128, to fill out our digital connection card right from your phone. You can also text GIVE to 417-256-3128 to give online, or you can place your offering in the boxes at the door exits. The Lottie Moon Christmas Offering supports international missions around the world. Check out this video. The most effective form of evangelism, obviously, is one-on-one. -on -one. That direct person who knows you, who sees your walk, uh, and says, okay, God is real to this person. Why isn't he real to me? And they begin seeking. But how do you get to that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the person? Particularly when you know, there's 4 million people here, there's only about 7,000 evangelicals in the whole country. How do you find that person who is seeking? How do you find that person who's open? And so you need a big net. And then basically that, the, the radio is one of our big nets um, for evangelism. It has a reach uh, for the majority of Zagreb, which is a city of a million people. And during our two 15 minute uh, time slots, there's about 40,000 people listening, uh, which blew our minds. Now, obviously, that's the main purpose is broad seed and sowing. About a year into the broadcasting, a, a guy started visiting and he just mentioned casually, yeah, I've been listening to the radio for about a year before I decided to come to the Sunday evening service. He said, listen, um, I have an old property that I'm not using. Uh, why don't you guys come over during the week and have a Bible study? So now that has become a second church plant. The Southern Baptists have had a huge role in what, uh, what has been an amazing uh, spiritual change. And to keep that going, uh, that we would see that this new lost continent uh, would be found through the Lottie Moon offering. There's an impact I know, but then I think there's an enormous impact that, that I'll never know until, until we're in heaven and, and see. I believe that what we're seeing now is the first fruits, but the one thing that keeps me here is this, this idea that I'm going to miss out on the most amazing thing that could possibly happen. And to be able to watch what God does and to begin to see the faces of the people coming in and their stories of how their lives have changed and how they've been brought out of, of such of a mess and into life. That, that, that's what I hope for and pray for. Uh, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, you know, uh, an entire life uh, would be worth it. Pastor John will be leading a new one-on-one -on -one with God Bible study starting in January 2021. If you are interested, you can sign up in the lobby, on our website, or by calling the church office. High school seniors and college students leave for the cross conference tomorrow. The cost is $20. It's still not too late to sign up to go. If you are interested, contact Austin Riggs. There will be no Wednesday night activities this week. We hope you have a very happy new year. Thank you for joining us in worship today. We hope you leave the service closer to him.
Well, good morning, church. Uh, We're so glad that you are here on this last Sunday of 2020. Hallelujah. (laughs) As hard as 2020 has been, uh, when we watch the video, you can really see that God has done great things. Um, There has been a great deal of of successes in this year, and we're so thankful that the team put together that video for us to be able to remember that our God is is awesome. If you would stand, join us as we begin to worship. uh, Blessed be your name.
may be seated. Well, for this last Sunday of the year, hopefully I can hear. Just, there we go. Um, the Christmas, of course, Christmas Day is, is past, but the Christmas season is, is very much, should always be in our heart. And um, uh, Steve provided me the opportunity to, to sing one last Christmas song uh, today, and it is uh, one of my absolute favorites.
right, I have to uh, confess, I have not already had to preach today. I'm only going to get to preach this one time today. I've got plenty of energy, and so you all may be in for it. Right, so here we are in this series, and I'm excited to be able to share with you all today. It's just that time of year where I feel like it's a little bit more like um, family. You know, it just feels a little bit more uh, casual. And so that's the attitude that I'm coming with, and so I hope you all are okay with that. Um, we're in this series called Promise. It's the last one of this series, and it's the last one of this year. And so I may throw in all sorts of other things as well. We're going to be looking today, our primary text is Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. We're also going to end with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The theme of today's message is the revelation of God revealed. And so when we look at this, and when we look at the idea of revelation, sometimes we automatically think of, well, it's the one about the end times. It's obviously talking about that. And that's not necessarily where we're going today. But then even as I say that, you're like, but one of our primary texts is in Revelation. And so what I want us to understand is really kind of where I'm trying to come from on this concept and where where we're going in. So we're just going to dive right in to Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Here's what it says. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests to his God and Father. Whenever I'm looking at this idea and when we're coming to this thought, what I want us to understand as we're looking at this is not necessarily to think of necessarily the book of Revelation. What I want you to see is that Jesus Christ is the revelation of God. What I want you to understand in this concept is that God was revealing himself through the person of Jesus Christ. And so sometimes we think of the book of Revelations or we automatically go when we hear the word revelations to end time thought. But really what I'm trying to make sure that we understand is that there was a void between us and God. There was something keeping us from knowing who God is. There was something keeping us from being able to understand who he was in his image. And what God did is he, at great cost to himself, sent Jesus so that Jesus could reveal to us his character. So today as we're looking at this, I want us to just really reflect on that idea. If we were to talk about theological terms, you may hear different ideas like uh, there's the general revelation of God, and that's what he reveals to everyone through every sunset and every sunrise, through nature itself, God is revealing himself. And then you can talk more about specific revelation in the fact that he gave us his word, that he gives us the Holy Spirit. Today, I'm looking at the specific revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And so let's look at this idea. Jesus is perfect. He's perfect. Before we go on with that, I'm going to go back and just read that text once again because I want to make sure that you all, now that I've maybe framed this a little bit better, are able to grab what I'm talking about. He's saying, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is 
and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. So we get to this place where we look and see he's perfect. So then how can I substantiate that claim? He's perfect. Well, he's perfect in his revelation. See what scripture refers to him as the faithful witness. He was a faithful witness. What's that mean? That 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 he came to witness about, he was faithful to it. That what he came to do, the message he came to share, he was faithful. He lived that out. And so you look at what scripture describes and it says he was the faithful witness. We see that in verse five. Number two, he's perfect in his resurrection. Look at what that's saying, what that's claiming, what that's interacting with. In his resurrection, he's the firstborn from the dead. Again, that's in verse five. Now we could skip past that and really ignore its meaning. But what I want you to understand is that means more to you in your life than you could possibly understand. See, because there's one thing that all of us know. Death at some point is coming. And we don't like to reflect on that. You're like, John, it's Christmas time. Like, don't be a killjoy. But this is a reality that we must face. Death will someday come to all of us. And it's the kind of thing that if we contemplate on it too much, we take on a dark note. We begin to look pretty horrible. We begin to allow it to wrap us up. We can be the kind of people who become the Scrooges, right? We're the Grinches of Christmas when we meditate on that thought too much. But here's what I want you to see that Jesus did. He came and he looked death in the face and he took its greatest blows. He endured its greatest strikes and he was dead. And then by his power, he stood up. And he was resurrected. And as he was resurrected, he not only folded up his clothes and laid them down, at least some of them. He not only walked out of the grave after the stone was rolled away, but he came out and he appeared to over 500 people. What I want you to understand is he wasn't simply resurrected. He kicked death's, you put the word in. He did it. And here's what this means. Here's what this means. We don't have to be afraid of death. Now listen, none of us are like, yay, firstborn from the dead. But you begin to think about it, and you realize that he took our greatest fear and obliterated it, and then reached back to us and said, come here, child, walk with me. Firstborn from among the dead says several things. One, it says that he was the first one. But two, it also indicates that he's not the only one, right? It indicates that we also are coming, that we who have placed our faith in him are right in line with him, that we also get to follow him. So we look at this idea as him being the firstborn from the dead, and we realize that he is perfect in his resurrection. So we look at him at who he is. He's perfect in his revelation, what he's revealed to us about the character of God, we realize that he is perfect in his resurrection. Next, we see that he is perfect in his rule. Now, why would I say that? See, in verse 5, it goes on to say that he is the ruler of kings on earth. So who's in charge? Now, you can look and you can see some of these people of influence that don't 
behave the way that you want them to. We could judge. But it's also very important that we also in our mind realize that there's times where he tells me to do things and I don't. There's times where I get intoxicated with the power that I have. There's times where I blatantly decide that my way may be better than his. Even as I say that, I realize it's ignorant. But I also know that it's our nature. God tells us to be a certain way and we agree, especially at church. Then we go get in the car and people are mean in the car. <laughs> and so we respond accordingly. And then we live with those people. And people at the restaurant don't cater to us the way we thought they should. And people at work don't accomplish the things that we think they should. And next thing we know, everything that we believed at church doesn't work its way out in our life. And we don't obey his rule. But it doesn't mean any less that we are accountable to him. And there is a time where our king will come and establish his rule clearly. In the meantime, he is being patient, waiting on us, waiting on those that he's put in authority to obey. You should be praying for your leaders. Four, he is perfect in redemption. Why would I say something like that? Well, if you look in verse six, it says this phrase, him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Now I can tell we're not close to Thanksgiving, but apparently some of y'all still had some turkey. All right, tryptophan, you're being mellow. I only have one service, so I can spend all my energy here. Right? So what I'm going to tell you is that that is worthy of a hallelujah. Right? If we were a cooler church, somebody would have got up and started dancing. Right? That is worthy of our celebration as we begin to look at this. In his redemption, we look at how he is perfect. Why? Because him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Now, there's some really important pronouns, right? It's talking about him who loves us. It's obviously talking about Jesus, has freed us, talking about us, from our sins, meaning not theirs, but ours. Right, so I'm owning that. So I'm just going to make that a little more personal. He's freed me from my sins. Now listen. I may not know you specifically. Though some of you I do, so don't take this personal. But I know the way that we are as humans. And sometimes we do things that we don't mean. And sometimes we do things that we have strong regrets for. And sometimes we behave in such a way where we're ashamed. And sometimes because of our pride, we can't even admit that. So we dig the hole even deeper. And sometimes other people do those stupid things to us, and now we get mad about that. And all of these things we look at and we call that sin. And so then I look at this, it says, him who loves us and has freed us from our sins, he has freed me from my sins. Now, listen, I know y'all are trying to act tough. But that 
is a huge deal. Like all of your regrets, all of your shames, all of your stupidity, all of your pride, all of your arrogance, he looks right into your lives and says, I see you, you naughty little wretch. And still, I love you. Him who loves us has freed us from our sins. Now, it's real important that we understand that last phrase, by his blood. See, this earlier part was all about us, but look, it makes it very clear. No, it's about his blood. Why? Because his blood is perfect. Why? Because his innocence is complete. Why? Because his rule is everything. Why? Because his resurrection has already beaten the consequences. Why? Because his revelation is the very character of God. He comes to show us, and it's his blood that was poured out for us. And so then we begin to say in our own lives, oh my goodness. Like how amazing is God that he would endure, that he would endure such agony because of our stupidity he has freed us his redemption is perfect it's complete five in his reign Jesus is perfect in his reign. What that's really describing there is that he delegates his rule. Earlier we looked at him being perfect in rule. Now it says by his reign, he has made us a kingdom. Priests to his God and Father. You ever had somebody who was your boss who didn't believe in you? And like in your mind, you're like, I could do a whole lot better, but they can't see the good that I do. You ever had a boss that's like, I can't delegate that to them because they're not going to be able to pull it off. Well, in my mind, that's how I feel about myself when God gives me a task. Like, God's like, hey, John, you're a priest. And I'm like, uh, I have a manager who says that that won't work. That's not a very good idea. Like, have you seen me? Like, I can't do that. I can't make that happen. Have you seen the way that I am? Have you like, I don't even know the rules. Like, I can't be that. He's like, it doesn't matter, John. You're a priest. And then here's what's weird. You are too. And that same funky feeling that I just admitted that I have, that you're like, I can't do that. I can't be that. I can't accomplish those things. Here's what I want us to understand. The Holy Spirit comes in us and truly makes us a kingdom of priests. What's that saying? He puts in us his spirit so that we can live out his hope, so that we can live out his intention, so that we can live out his purposes for our lives. And he makes us his kingdom, priests to his God and Father. See, Jesus is perfect, and he is our ruler. And guess what keeps his reign from being strong? Our confidence in his call. Us resisting his plan. My mom was reading Facebook this morning or last night or something and she came across a, a little quote that I thought was cute. 
It said, nobody tell 2021 it's our year. We're going to go in quietly and don't touch anything. I thought that was cute because I've actually heard my mom as we've come into stores before, like, you know, with all the glass and the figurines, it's like, hold my hand, do not touch anything. And my hands, like, start, put your hand in my pocket, you know, like, don't move, right? Don't touch it. And, and it's this idea of, like, 2021, like, hey, let's handle it with kid gloves because 2020 wasn't our favorite. But here's kind of what's in my mind. It's time for Christians to not live in fear. It's time for us to say, God made us a kingdom. God, my God, who is the ruler of all things, the perfect redeemer, the one who has whipped death already, my God has said to me, you're my child, you're my priest. You're the one that I'm sending in. You're my light. You're my flame of hope. You are the one that I'm sending out to make an impression on this world. And at some point, we have to quit being chickens. At some point, we got to raise up and say, this is our year, not because we're better, but because our God reigns. And it's time for us to stop worrying. Verse 6 goes on and says this, To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. <laughs> amen. I like it when Scripture even amens itself. Right? It knows you all weren't going to do it, and so it went ahead and did it, right? That's what it lays out there for us. To Him, look at this. So we're looking at how perfect he is, how amazing he is, how wonderful he is. And then it says, to him be the glory and dominion, which means power, authority, forever and ever. Amen. See, it's not going to change. It doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter who's ruling in other countries. It doesn't matter. What matters is that our king is Jesus amen. and to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever amen look at what verse 7 says behold he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him look at that can you just imagine that day coming behold he's coming what's that mean behold is an old word that we don't use very often anymore but what it really is saying is look look he's coming the day is coming, he's coming, and every eye will see him. Listen, not just your eyes, but every eye that you share him with will see him. And every response that they've given will be obvious. And they will either think, why didn't you tell me of how glorious this God is who's coming? Or they'll say, you did tell me. Thank you that I got to see him and confess him as Lord long before this. Or they'll say, you told me, and I didn't believe, but every eye will see. Whatever you're afraid of when it comes to witnessing, when it comes to sharing, what I want you to know is it's time to be done with that. It's time to let go of that. It's time for us to share who he is and what he is and how amazing he is. It's time for us to recognize that someday every eye will see. Look, it goes on and says, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Why? Why? Because they've either rejected him or they've not known of him ahead of time. So today, you're in a unique class. Chances are good. You've already heard of him. Chances are really good that you've already embraced him as your Lord. 
So what that does to me is it says, well, then I want to make sure that others are hearing. I want to make sure that I am leveraging my strength, my ability to reach out in his name. I want to make sure that I'm not just making this earth about me and my comfort, but instead about who he is. See, because every eye will see and many around the world going to not share the joy that I share when I see him coming because when I see him coming I'm going to hoop and holler Amen. I might lose my Baptist card <laughs> I mean I'm going to go crazy I can't wait I sometimes in prayer get so excited about that idea but I can't imagine what I would feel like if I didn't know him and I'm asking you all to at least give that a little thought as you think about your friends who don't yet know him. He goes on and finishes with these three words. Even so, amen. Why? Because he's worth it. Like even though there's going to be that attitude, even though there's going to be regret, even though there's going to be so, he is worthy, he's worth it. And so they're saying, even so, amen. So verse 8 goes on, and here's what he says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So we look at who Jesus is. He's perfect in so many ways. And then we look at what this says and we see that he is triumphant. One, he is Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He's the one who wrote the story. He's the one who knows what you were before you were crafted in your mother's womb and who knows you through your life. He's the one who knows the details and knows every hair on your head. He's the one who knows the circumstances that we faced in 2020 and how they've impacted us and how they've prepared us for 2021. He's the one who knows what's happening in our family and how this has encouraged us to be together as a family and how it's also encouraged our friendship and it's changed us. He knows the way that it's exposed our selfishness he's known the whole way he is the beginning and the end the starter and the finisher he's the one now I'm of this age I'm from what's called generation X it's not a celebrated generation kind of the in-between but there's certain things that I do like from generation X and that is a movie series called the matrix I don't know if y'all remember that. I saw a little bit of a grimace right there, even as I said it again. I'm from Generation X. I apologize. But there was a guy in there that they referred to him as the one. They had this hope that this one was coming and that he was going to save the day. And that's what my mind comes to whenever I think. It says, he is the one who is and was and is to come. He's talking about Jesus. He's the one that all of our hopes have been pinned on. He's the one that we have been anticipating. He's the one that's going to fix all the wrongs. He's the one who's going to walk us through and show us our way to the promised land. He's the one who's going to fix it all. And so whenever I look at this, he is the one who was and is and is to come. And you begin to realize he's the one that we've been waiting for. He's the one that I can trust. And finally, it says the almighty. I just get excited about that. I don't even think I comprehend what almighty means. I know it means all and mighty, but when you put those two together, it really just blows my mind. I, I know it's so big that it creates a mound of bigness over here. And then what's weird is I look at my problems and they seem huge to me. But what's interesting is I go to my problems and I can pick them up and I can take them to him and I can compare them 
and almighty at least means that he's bigger than my problem. I'm not for sure that I grasp completely how big Almighty is. I don't think that it's something that I can wrap my head around, but what I do know is that I can grab my problems and I can bring them to Almighty and realize that whatever my problems are, He is bigger. And He does these random things and makes things right and is faithful when I'm not and loves me with a perfect love and when I love him to the best of my ability and it's never able to add up he is almighty He's the Almighty. So as I look at that scripture today from Revelation, it gives me an opportunity just to look at who he is, and it also gives me an opportunity to look forward into next year. It would be my greatest joy if we didn't make it to next year. Right? If he comes back and whew, we're gone and we're celebrating. However, We've got all of next year's sermons planned out, so you all need to stay tuned. Amen. And what I know is this. We're going to be focusing on the concept of worship. Whenever I talk about worship, oftentimes we immediately think of what they've done up here on the stage today, which, by the way, is awesome. I'm pretty amazed with the people that we have. I'm even more amazed whenever I know their hearts their kindness, their sincerity. But what worship is, it's not necessarily singing because some of you all would never be able to worship. <laughs> worship is having a right picture of God and responding appropriately. So today as we've looked at who he is, so we've looked at how perfect Jesus is. We've had a picture of who he is. So then worship is simply responding appropriately. See, I used to think that worship was me doing something extravagant for God. Me doing something exceptional for God. Me doing something big for God. Me sacrificing something great for God. And then I realized it doesn't matter how big my sacrifice could be. It's not worthy of who he is. It doesn't matter how big of an offering I can bring. It's not worthy of how majestic he is. So what can I give? What I can, I give him. Give him my heart. Hebrews 12, 1 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What's it saying? Because of the witnesses, because of his glory, let us throw off everything that hinders us. The sin that has woven its way into the very fabric of who, are, who we are. It's time for us to cut rid of some of these things. It's time for us to get rid of some of those things. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Then it says, looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. You could read that, the Alpha and Omega. You could read that, the one who was and is and is to come. You see, the author and perfecter, the founder and perfecter of our faith says, look to him. That one, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What is the joy that is set before him? I believe that it was him obeying the Lord, him obeying his father, but I also believe that it was him bringing obedient servants with that same heart. That someday he knew we would be inspired by his glory. We would be inspired by his greatness. That we would be inspired by his majesty. And that we would get off of our apathetic seats. And that instead we would run for him. That we would begin to see his glory. And that we would get up and run. He says, for the joy set before him endured the cross says despising its shame, but I see that as him sloughing it off, throwing it off, and he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So today, I don't know if you've seen this, but we have gone through huge chunks of the Bible. This year I've looked at it from a bird's eye view, and the whole point is to show you that on every page of scripture, it glorifies Jesus Christ. It points to who he is. It points to his greatness. It points to his power. It points to his sovereignty. It points to the fact that he is the perfect revelation of God himself. He came to show the very character of God. We've seen that throughout Scripture, whether that be in the Old Testament or the New Testament. We've seen that whether that was in the law or whether that was in the narratives of how he lived. We've seen that whether that was written in the stories of the Old Testament or whether it was talking about his crucifixion. We've seen that in every aspect of who he is and how he leads things through. And we see that he is the revelation of God. And so today... I invite every one of you to place your hope in him. What I'm begging you to do is to see his greatness and respond appropriately. Now, it may be that you've not yet given your life to Christ, and today you realize, I want to know him. I don't want him to know me. I want to live for him, and I want that to be everything. If that's the case, I'll have ministers here. We'll be ready to pray with you. And if there's too many people that come forward, then I'll have some of our deacons come forward and pray with people. But this is the moment for us to have those transactions where we realize this is a God worth serving. Now, it may be that you've already given your life to Christ, but you've debated in your mind about his worth. You've not done that on purpose, but... You've heard him command and you've withheld. You've heard him tell you to step out in obedience, to trust him. And instead you've said, I've got my own plans. I've got my own agenda. Today, what I want you to do is look at who he is and realize he is worthy. And I am calling on you. Repent. Turn from your pride. Turn from your stubbornness. Turn from that attitude. And run to him. It could be today that none of those things are on your mind. What's on your mind is his glory and you just want to praise him. I invite you to come to the altar and worship him and honor him. But I think this is the perfect time to do it because 2020 has thrown quite a few curveballs. All of us should be thankful that we've survived it. But what we also need to do is say, God, I'm going to follow you. You have conquered death, and I'm ready to follow you wherever you go. Pray with me, will you? God, not only are you our Father, but you are our perfect Redeemer. 
You're a perfect father. God, you have done everything that you've ever said you would do. You've accomplished everything that you ever said you would accomplish. You have given us hope. And so today, Father, we find ourselves wanting to worship you. Wanting to respond to you because you're great. So show us. We promise not to resist you. Show us how you want us to respond. And we'll do it. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Don't resist him. Stand. Let's worship. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. love this song and I kind of hate it like I love the sentiment of it amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me I'm amazed at what that's saying and what that's communicating and at the same time it then says this line in all that I do I honor you and I find myself feeling like maybe I don't like I really wish that that could be so true. And I endeavor to make that true. I want that to be true. But what I come to is I realize that I have to have the Holy Spirit to do that in me. And I'm just trusting him to make this song true in my life. Here's what I know. I watched that video about you all earlier. I'm amazed, church, at what you do. I'm amazed at what you accomplish. Beautiful. And still I know that we resist him. I cannot imagine what this church would be if we chose not to resist him. What would happen if we chose to put our yes on the table for this coming year and just obey? I know not all of you will do that. But I know if only a few of you will, we're going to change this area. And guess what? It needs changed. It needs God's love. It needs his touch. It's time for us to bash in the gates of hell. It's time for us to quit playing nice guy. So be praying for me and my leadership. Be praying for our staff and their leadership. Be praying for the roles that have taken leadership within our church. Be praying for our Sunday school classes and their leaders. Be praying for our ministries because there is a lot to be done in the coming year. And be praying for yourself. Because it may be that God is calling you to step up and lead with us. Pray with me, will you? 
God, thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for 2020. It's not been our favorite gift. But God, you've used it to teach us and to train us. To bring us back to the things that matter the most. To see you as our foundation. Our truth teller. Our God. Now help us live in your glory as we move into this new year. We pray these things, Jesus Christ, in your name and for your glory. Amen. You all have a fantastic week. I certainly love you. Hope you have a happy new year. Be safe.